Norm Finkelstein talking to Mark Lamont Hill about um, Gaza. The U.S. could have stopped Israel on day one. Israel's brutal war on Gaza continues, and Israel is facing a case of genocide at the International Court of Justice. But are we at a turning point for Western support of Israel? And what future is there for Gaza and for Palestine more broadly? Earlier, I went to New York to speak to one of the foremost scholars on Israel-Palestine, Norman Finkelstein. Professor Norman Finkelstein, thanks so much for joining me on Up Front. Thank you for having me. You've been an advocate for Palestinian freedom mm -hmm. for decades. You devoted much of your life, certainly your scholarship, to this. Uh, you're also the child of Holocaust survivors. Your parents mm -hmm. uh, were in the Warsaw ghettos during the uprising. They were both taken to concentration camps. Your father was even in the Auschwitz death march. How do experiences like this inform your work? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I came from a very political home. That was just a fluke of fate. No other people who survived, they weren't steeped in, immersed in, passionate about politics. <clears throat> my parents were. Actually, I'm not sure if this is the best way to begin the interview, but my parents had a very turbulent, tormented marriage. I think both of them never really recovered from what happened to them and what happened to their families on both sides. Every member of the family was exterminated. And so it was not a happy marriage. Um, but I remember my mother once saying to me that for all, your, for all the horrors of the marriage, we never disagreed on politics, meaning she and my father. And they had very strange politics by current standards. They were both fanatically pro-Soviet, pro-Russian, because they looked at the world through the lens of the Nazi Holocaust. Mm. And the Soviet Union defeated the Nazis, there's no question about that. 90% uh, of the German troops, the army, they were fighting on the Eastern Front. Um, my parents were fanatical Stalinists. Long after the Soviet Union had distanced itself from Stalin, the famous speech by Khrushchev in 1956, um, my parents would not brook any criticism of Stalin hmm. till, the, their de till their last days, their last breaths. Um, and I think they were probably the only two Stalinists left in the <laughs> world. It was very funny when I, let's say when I was in seventh grade, who was professor, the teacher, was Josh Abramson. And we were discussing World War II, and I didn't know better. I was defending Stalin and Russia and singing their <laughs> praises. I remember the uh, teacher, Mr. Abramson, he said that you realize how many people Stalin killed? So what do I know in seventh grade? So I went home and I said to my mother, do you realize how many people Stalin killed? And she said, well, Stalin said that this generation is going to suffer, but the next generation will live better. Next day I go up to sc go into school, raise my hand. Stalin said this generation will suffer, but the next generation will live better. So Mr. Abramson says, in other words, you're saying, Mr. Finkelstein, he did call us by our surnames. He said, in other words, Mr. Finkelstein, you're saying that the ends justify the means. Well, I didn't have a clue what that meant. But I went home and I said to my mother, in other words, mom, you're saying the ends justify the means. And she said, well, in this case, yes. And I went back and I just repeated it. I had the clue what I was talking about, obviously. Um, so you've been riling people up for years. <laughs> well, I wasn't intentionally doing it, but you understand that at that age, you're very influenced by your parents. Yeah. I remember in sixth grade, it was 1964, and it was the presidential election. It was between um, Lyndon Johnson and Barry Goldwater. And my parents were very, again, 64, before being anti-war was popular. They were very anti the Vietnam War. And I came to class one day, and I raised my hand, and I said, well, in my opinion, Lyndon Baines, President Johnson is belligerent, okay? The teacher said, sit down, you don't even know what the word means. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've heard you say something like that in interviews before. <laughs> I've been watching on the internet lately. But let me ask you something, though, because you are a controversial voice, clearly since middle school. Uh, you're, one Great of, school. I'm <laughs> you're one of the leading you know, scholars in the world on this topic, but you're also one of the most controversial ones. I mean, you've been called, quote, the mm -hmm. foremost Jewish anti-Semite mm -hmm. on planet Earth. Some people mm -hmm. even call you a Holocaust denier. Mm -hmm. but why does your work generate these types of responses? Um, I think it's a kind of paradox to tell you the truth, because as you well know, my actual political opinions are very conventional and well within the mainstream. For example, long after the whole of the left went over to this notion of one state, I was still advocating two states, yeah. whereas the whole left was... It's true. <clears throat> it's true. He actually was, and that's why originally, uh, originally he had a falling out with BDS and BDS supporters. He's talked about this quite a bit, where, uh, like... He lost his like only, uh, only leg of support when he took this position. I'm trying to 
anchor their thinking in things like settler colonialism and this and that, I was very firm in just in repeating what international law said. I, I thought that was the best vocabulary uh, to try to reach a broad audience. So the controversial part comes, I think, from there's a certain element of, I will say, fanaticism to me, which is I read everything and I'm ready to cite chapter and verse and everything. So I don't give my, so to speak, adversaries any wiggle room. There's not a kind of debate. No, I go in for the kill. Yes. You're lying. That's not true. That's false. And I <clears throat> am relentless. I know that I'm relentless because I spend, a, I think it's a kind of ideological war. Um, and I'm, I am relentless. I know that, but that's because I do the work. Have you lost faith in those, mm -hmm. ref in those reference points and those frameworks? I mean, I know you used past tense when you mm -hmm. said, I held on to the, the, the mm -hmm. two-state idea. Mm -hmm. I believed in international law. Mm -hmm. Do you now no longer have faith that those are effective oh. frameworks for getting a pr practical outcome? Okay, those are two separate questions. Yeah. Um, on the question of international law, obviously it moves very slowly, you know, pain painfully slowly when people are being killed in the genocide. And so there's a certain degree of more than impatience, there's a degree of indignation. So, for example, on the car ride over here, I was reading the new International Court of Justice uh, response to South Africa. And it goes on for about 12 pages. And they say, we have to first consider this point. We have to first consider that point. And we have to first consider this, that, and other. All right, come on, guys. Let's just cut to the chase. People are getting killed. People are dying of starvation. But on the other hand, I have to say there's a kind of, I don't know, I was kind of touched by the fact that at the end of the day, the law at a huge price for the people of Gaza, but the law seems to be kicking into place. And for example, right now as we speak, 31% of children under the age of two are facing acute malnutrition in the northern part of Gaza. They went through the evidence and they concluded, no, Israel has got to give, let the food in. You know, It took 12 pages. It took six months, but the law is, you know, kicking in, so. But will I, the food be let in? I mean, we saw after the January yeah, decision, I know. not much changed. I know, and then what do you do? Mm. You know, on the one hand, it's a very slow, tedious process, uh, while the numbers of, uh, since the January 26th decision of the court, uh, 5,000 more people have been killed. So, yeah, it's, so then, why do you why why do you have any optimism that mm -hmm. any of this matters? Uh, particularly because I think about in 2020 when you actually mm -hmm. stopped writing on Gaza, mm -hmm. and you said you felt like the work you you were doing was yeah. sort of uh, I think you said pointless and mm -hmm. purposeless. Mm -hmm. um, why is it less pointless and purposeless now when we see legal decisions coming out, international mm -hmm. outrage, and yet Israel still remaining fairly obstinate? I guess the simple answer is twofold. Number one, if you do nothing, you can be certain nothing will happen. So mm -hmm. that's not an option. And um, the, the second uh, thing is... Dude, he promises a fun day? Dude, what do you mean? If this ain't fun for you, I don't know what to tell you. ...that you do see changes. I mean, it's not what you would want, obviously, but you do see change. For the IC, first of all, the fact that South Africa went to bat for Palestine. Extraordinary. You know, not one Arab state, not one Arab state, it took South Africa, you know? The fact that the vote was 14 to 2. I said, this is impossible before the vote. I kept counting. I could only come up with six countries that we vote for. Wow. If you, I would have bet every single dollar I own that it was impossible that the U.S. and Germany would vote yes. Hmm. There are grounds to be optimistic. Not the least, for me, the most optimistic thing is the young people. Hmm. If you had told me that people were going to keep coming out to demonstrations week after week after week after week. I, for six months, I would never have believed it. The tenacity, the conviction, you know, it's, it's really an extraordinary sight to behold. You know, somebody Place. said I was at a demonstration three weeks ago. It was at Washington Square Park in Manhattan. It was pouring rain. And it was um, a Saturday. And there were about 50,000 people there. And um, they were all around 25. I was an age cohort of one. And then there was a gap, literally, there was a gap of 40 years, wow. you know? And then after it was over, a lot of people went down to the subway to go home. And so in the subway platform, 
on this side of the, uh, of the train tracks and then on the other side of the train tracks, everyone's still chanting, everyone's still chanting. If you know the scenes from the civil rights movement in the United States, yeah. how when they were in jail, they kept singing and they kept chanting and they kept singing and they kept chanting. I really want to know if you would condemn Islam since it openly supports slaughter and pedo. I can give verses from scholars to back this. <laughs> oh man, that's awesome. I like that we have to have this conversation every fucking day, dude. Every day. Listen, brother. Religion is a weapon that you can wield in the direction of good or in the direction of evil. If you think that the entirety of a religion and all of its supporters are exactly the same as the most brain dead, most fundamentalist charlatans and their advocacy, you're simply doing backwards thinking. Okay. This is small mindedness. That's it. That's all it is. Now, this kind of thinking might actually help or might actually be celebrated in other circles, but this is not one of those circles. You will not find any allies with this kind of sentiment. Absolutely zero people should think that Ben Shapiro represents the average Jewish sentiment. Absolutely zero people should think that the Christian fundamentalists represent the average Christian sentiment. And many don't, especially in the Western world. Because in the Western world, Ben Shapiro and others also say that this is a, a nation founded on Judeo-Christian values. This is considered a part of the in-group, so you can actually have more nuanced thinking. Because this is what you grew up with. This is what you learned. So you know that no, not all Christians believe in the most fundamentalist aspects and not all Jewish people believe in the bastardization of Judaism to begin with. Okay? But you somehow feel as though Islam and all of its supporters are monolithic. Nowhere in the Bible advocates for these things. Ah, ah, my friend. The Bible has been utilized to advocate for slavery. What do you mean? I mean, just the simple question alone of how old was Mary when God fucked her. should help you come to different conclusions than the ones you currently have and no murder Bible's got a lot of murder the difference of course is that I do not believe that this represents the entirety of the Christian religion nor does it represent the entirety of Christian believers of the faith. Every religion has been used in support of awful things, whether it be slavery, genocide, pedophiles, or incest. I already had addressed that, but I guess you failed to recognize that. And it was like these young people, except there's one difference. The people in the civil rights movement were fighting for their own rights. Right. These were young people fighting for Gaza. You know, two million people in a, some ghetto way off in the Middle East. It's deeply inspiring. Oh, absolutely. So there's every reason on those grounds, both to be proud of, you know, the capacity of human sympathy and solidarity, uh, but also <clears throat> on the grounds of being hopeful. As a follower of Christ, I can say Bible, especially Old Testament, has some very unethical elements that we would never find acceptable today. There was also very ethical elements in the Old Testament, my favorite being 
the the one about uh, how 30 children were making fun of a bald man, and then the bald man said, fuck you, and then bears came and ate those children. Never make fun of the bald. That's actually a good lesson. Yeah. Bald man bear. One of the things you talked about was how arguments that were on the margins have shifted, at least mm -hmm. to the mainstream, to be debated. They're now debatable. Correct. They're engageable. And they no longer can be shot down with you're an anti-Semite. Right. Those days are over. You made an argument recently that turned some heads, to be mm -hmm. sure. Uh, you said uh, that Hamas's October 7th attack was comparable in some ways to Nat Turner's slave revolt, uh, mm -hmm. a rebellion of enslaved black Americans in Virginia that took place in 1831. You've also referred to Gaza frequently as a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. uh, those types of historical comparisons probably aren't in the mainstream yet. Uh, in fact, they offend some people, they outrage some people. Why do you make them? Well, the primary reason I make them is because I think they're true. Now, uh, the Nat Turner Rebellion was replete with the most horrifying atrocities. Yeah. The order Nat Turner, for those of you who don't know, because I don't know what your audience is. Exodus 12.7 advocates for and says the terms for selling your daughter into slavery. Fucking, dude, that's just the free market. Uh, the United States had not a lot, but it had slave rebellions before the Civil War. And the best known one and the most famous one was um, the Nat Turner Rebellion. Uh, they killed about 60 people in the Nat Turner Rebellion. Uh, the order given by Nat Turner, according to the historians, the order was very straightforward kill all whites. Yeah. That was the order, kill all whites. And they proceed to do just that. So when I read that, when I read that, a light went off on in my head and I said, okay, now I have something roughly uh, analogous to October 7th. So now my next challenge is, okay, so how do you render a judgment on the Nat Turner Rebellion? So I figured I would go to the people who were, so to speak, closest to me in my political trajectory, which yeah. would be the abolitionists, those who were um, fighting for the end of slavery. However, they were very strictly against the use of violence. And oh my God, I just realized how fucking fat his calves are. Dude, not the slut shame, but put those away, Norm. God damn, he's got some daddy calves up in this bitch. What the fuck? That's why, I mean, he is in great shape for his age. He's like 800 years old. God damn. That boy thick as hell. He's never coming on. Stop saying he pressed, it's pressed against his leg, okay? My man is literally about to burst from the seams, regardless of whether it's pressing on his legs or not. You're out of your fucking mind. That's a big old calf pressed up against his other leg or not, dude. Fuck you mean. Yeah, turns out he's not just working his brain out at the library. He's working his body out as well. To Norm Finkelstein, I say, your body is T. So I was curious. Okay, how did they judge, assess the Nat Turner Rebellion? And Show so them free Calphastein. <laughs> I turned to William Lloyd Garrison, who was one of the most famous of the Emerson. abolitionists. He edited the newspaper called The Liberator. And it's very worth reading it, what he said. He began by saying, we told you so. Because he was speaking to white people. We told you so. We told you, if you keep treating people this way, if you treat them this way. Where'd that, where'd that Christianity doesn't support any of those things guy go? Did he just learn about a lot of stuff about Christianity all of a sudden? That guy stopped talking as soon as we started mentioning Bible verses in here real quick. It shut him down so fast. Like, I, I'm, like I said, I'm not a fucking r slash atheist Andy at all. I'm not, but it, it is pretty funny that he was just, he had to be like, no, dude, you don't understand. Like the Bible is different. The Quran, the final uncorrupted word of God states the sacred value of human life. Unlike any other book, like the Bible or gospel that were corrupted by humans. <laughs> okay, dude. Yes. Sure. It's the most uh, comprehensive. It's the third version. It's the best version.
brother. There's going to be a reaction. And he went on to say that, of course, atrocities, or I think he called it horrors, occur during the Nat Turner Rebellion. But if you read the statement from start to finish, he never condemned Nat Turner. He does not. It's, you know, it was for me a, an epiphanal moment because I spent the last 15 or more years of my life chronicling the horrors in Gaza. The fact that those folks who burst the gates of Gaza on October 7th had been born into a concentration camp. Not only were they born into it, but they were living in it and they were destined to die in it. And that was Nat Turner. But is this, a, is this an explanation from a dispassionate scholar who's simply saying, look how inevitable this violence on October mm -hmm. 7th was? Or is it an endorsement of the action by saying, look, they had no choice. This is literally the only legitimate well, and morally acceptable option they could make. Look, when you, make, when you pass moral judgments, in my opinion, you have to offer options. What else could they have done? So when Hamas was elected in 2006... Well, you've just talked about the international courts, right? So well, and you have a growing optimism. Yeah. Does that stuff only happen because of the armed resistance? Mm -hmm. In other words, would we have mm -hmm. the world's attention? Would there I would, be... I would, I'm going to say what the facts tell me. Now, I'm not saying I'm the only person in possession of the facts, yeah. but the facts is they tell me. In 2006, when Hamas was elected, it was elected on a reform platform because the Palestinian Authority is so corrupt, people wanted to change. Yeah. If you start, immediately as they were elected, the international community, first Israel, then the US, then the EU, imposed this brutal economic blockade on Gaza. Now, if you study the record, Hamas was attempting a diplomatic solution to the conflict. It talked about recognizing Israel, two states, having a long-term ceasefire. It made many options. All of it was rebuffed. All of it was rejected. Then, in March 2018, they attempted the Great March of Return, a nonviolent civil resistance. What happened? Well, we know exactly what happened. A UN investigative body produced a report with 250 single space pages. According to the report, Israel targeted, deliberately targeted children. Israel deliberately targeted medics. Israel deter deliberately targeted um, journalists. And here's the best one of all. Israel deliberately targeted disabled people. Okay? The best one. And they have the descriptions in the report. <laughs> Not the best one. No, nor. A person in the distance, on crutches, 300 meters from the perimeter fence, shot in the head. A person in the wheelchair, 200 meters, shot down. So, of course, the nonviolence is going to fail. If people are just being shot down, like, you know, swatted down like flies, and there's no international reaction, it can't work. The whole premise of nonviolent civil resistance is that if you're willing to incur the suffering, then the international community, or in the case of our own country during the civil rights movement, the North and the federal government will be moved by the violence, moved in sympathy uh, to act. When you show the violence, remember the whole point of nonviolence as uh, Martin Luther King understood it. If you read, for example, the letter from the Birmingham jail, the teaching a black person to read. Third thing that happened, they prohibited black people from congregating together, okay? Because the people thought he was giving sermons to the black people, and instead it turned out they were plotting the uh, uh, rebellion, okay? So someone like you would say, did that make any sense? Was it worth it? Right. 200 black people were killed, or 30,000 Gazans were killed. Uh, the law is now more repressive than ever, okay? So there's an argument there, but then along comes John Brown. And when you read John Brown, he says, I was inspired by Nat Turner. Okay? So then you could say, well, John Brown, what did he accomplish? His uh, uprising was put down in, the few, uh, in a, about a couple of days. Go. He was executed. John Brown, perfect demonstration of a quirked up white boy. Another very religious guy, by the way. I would say a religious nutter, as a matter of fact. Straight up, it, like, as close to insane as you can get. But sometimes, you need that. Okay? The most swagged out white boy to have ever done it. 
He was so crazy that literal black liberation advocates were like, yeah, dog, I think you're just going to die. Like, and I don't want to die yet. And he was like, nope, I'm going to do the damn thing. And he did. Go to with the sauce. Okay. But then along comes Frederick Douglass. And he delivers his famous speech on John Brown, one of his best, in my opinion. And he says, he goes through all the arguments. John Brown was a failure for this reason. John Brown was a failure for that reason. John Brown was a failure for this reason. And John Brown, like, you know, Nat Turner was a religious fanatic. So was John Brown. John Brown was just like Nat Turner. He was convinced he was a vessel of God and slavery was an abomination, which it was. But most people yeah. didn't believe it. It was Frederick Douglass, right? That was like, nah, nah, dude. <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> no, <laughs> John, you're weed too bad. You're, you're weed too strong, John Brown. You're bitch too bad. They'll kill you. Dude, you are going to die, is what he said, which he did. Except some point to his um, execution as the, the like, arbiter of the, the, the Civil War. It was that degree of abomination right. that you're going to give your life for it, okay? John met him in the 1840s with his plan, and Douglas said, that's an insane idea. You'll die. So along comes uh, Frederick Douglass, and he says, you know, there's a straight arrow line from John Brown to the Civil War. Now, okay, Norm. God, I fucking love Norm so much. He's so crazy, but like... Turner, John Brown, Civil War. Now, I know I leave out a lot of other factors, yeah. but it was a way station to the Civil War. And now Nat Turner occupies an honored place in American history. Yeah. The thing is, dude, listen, listen, listen. The thing is, sometimes people just need to be shown that it is permissible, okay? Sometimes people need to be shown that it is allowed or that people are willing to take the fucking initiative. That's what is important. I think that's what Norm is showing too here. Like these, these actions that might on its face come across as like tactical errors, who knows what kind of positive outcomes they may yield. So I say, I know people won't like it when I say it, but I think it's a question mark how October 7th is going to be regarded so, in so the future. If Nat Turner now occupies an honored place, I think it's a question mark. Um, and, and I think part of that will depend on Israel's response and continued mm -hmm. response. I mean, what do you think, given all the destruction, all the death mm -hmm. of people and the physical environment, what do you think Netanyahu's ultimate end game is here? The goal is uh, at one end of a spectrum, and the spectrum bleeds into each point, bleeds into each other. At one end is the ethnic cleansing, to just get rid of them, do what they did in 1948, and put an end to this uh, Gaza problem. But is that a realistic vision? I mean, I understand the idea of saying we're going to have civil and governmental mm -hmm. control over Gaza. We're going to maybe reinstall settlements as the pre-2006 mm -hmm. time. I doubt that. Right, but, but it seems equally doubtful that they could depopulate well, the entire I, I, strip. Okay, let's remember uh, time moves quickly. The first two weeks, it looked like, or they believed, that they were going to be able to expel the population to the Sinai. But at that point, Egypt made a firm decision. They're not coming in. Yeah. So one goal was the ethnic cleansing, but I agree with you. After two weeks, it seemed less plausible. No one still might happen. We don't know, you know, the pressures that will be exerted on CC. Uh, number two, the sort of middle position was the one that was advocated by Giora Eilem, uh, the former head of the National Security Council. He said, we'll give them two choices, stay and starve or leave. Mm. In other words, make Gaza uninhabitable. And then the other the extreme position was to just carry out you know, a destruction of Amalek to just wipe out the population in a kind of unnuanced uh, genocide. Yeah. So I think those are the three positions and what, what will come of it. What do you think is most likely to come of um, it? What's most likely? I think uh, because President Biden is having trouble with that a large part of that democratic base, I think the Gallup polls show that 
only 19% of Democrats supported what Israel is doing. Yeah. Uh, I think the pressures exerted by uh, Biden will become unbearable for Israel. Uh, and in the United States, is it, what is it? What is it unbearable? It will be another profiling purge, like we saw at the Security Council, where they just abstained. No, look. If the United States wanted to stop it from day one, it could have stopped it. You just pick up the phone and say, "No more veto, no more weapons. Uh, it's over, and it's over." There's, there's no question about is that. Is that possible as, as as a practical matter, given mm -hmm. this special relationship that right. the U.S. has had since the '60s? Well, it's it's uh, it's possible. The question is uh, the political will, and right now, President Biden is balancing. The uh, what they considered was Nat Turner based. I don't know. Do you think slavery was based to be their security interest? Because you know what happened October seventh was a blow for the United States security, also, because the United States has invested a lot in Israel as a regional power and and able to be a regional arbiter. Let, let me pause you there for a second because I spoke the other day to uh, Professor Mearsheimer, mm -hmm. uh, who said that it's a myth that. Uh, there's still a strategic and tactical interest for the United States to support Israel. That may have once been the case, but it's not anymore. All right, look, uh, John look at this guy. I don't know. Do you think the Al Qassam brigades are based then? <clears throat> I don't know. Do you think Israel's genocide is based? Because the same energy you have can be carried over in this exact same conversation. Like, I don't know why you think this is a gotcha. It's the same principle behind the. Uh, the the uh, Haitian Revolution, okay? I can't believe you would try to fucking sit here and 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 advocate. The point is. The point is. When all is said and done. Ain't nobody's talking about fucking the ANC and their practices of terrorism. And everyone celebrates their final political goal of the eradication of the South African apartheid as an objective good. Because the much greater evil here is the apartheid. The much greater evil here is the Israeli genocide of Palestinians. Things that people do in opposition to that, well... If their project succeeds and it is completely destroyed, things that people have things that people have done in opposition to that are always praised later down the line. John Mearsheimer is a good friend of mine. I like him, uh, <laughs> but we don't agree. I mean, people are, you know people are, are, can agree to disagree. I I don't agree on that point. I think the important thing to understand about Israel is Israel is very much like a Western society. It has the same kind of uh, bureaucracy, rationality, uh, modern outlook uh, that makes it very easy for the U.S. to communicate with Israel. And communication is not an, a trivial part. The security people, the intelligence people, they all have the same mental outlook. And so that's an irreplaceable factor for the U.S. to have a uh, what's sometimes called a stationary aircraft carrier in, in the Middle East, where An unsinkable the whole one. Uh, mental outlook is held in common. Also, it's still by far the most militarily competent. I'm, I'm not saying it's great. Um, it took a hit reputationally yeah, as well. It took a very big hit reputationally. And I don't think that was an accident. The, the rot has set in in Israeli society. It's become westernized. And that means there's an element of slovenliness to the way they carry, they conduct themselves. You said you watched. Oh, um, this is actually an interesting point. The debate I had. Yes, with, you're this is actually an interesting point that he just brought up. The rod has been said in Israeli society they become westernized is actually also correct. When Israel was doing the Nakba before Israel, it was people that had a shit ton of experience fighting in wars that had nothing to lose, okay? You had World War II veterans, you know what I mean? Obviously, they were still going up against, like, people who did not have a lot of experience fighting, mostly villagers. And from that point on, all the way until even 1967, um, a lot of the, the Israeli brigades were 
uh, were, were still very much coming from war-torn regions, people that have even been pogromed, people that, uh, people that had a lot of experience. I think it was with Felix that I was talking about this. Like, um, the idea, for example, that, um, the idea, for example, that, like, the Israeli spy apparatus was better early on because many of the Israelis were not, uh, I guess, like, westernized, but they were still, like, very much first generation from Arab countries. So they could actually, like, you know, they could actually blend in very well. Um, the very fact that when you hear, for example, when they try to do, like, fake telephone conversations, like, you can just hear the dude is not, uh, uh, like, a Palestinian. Oh, I think I was talking to Noah Cullowin about it. You're right. Maybe not Felix. Um, where, like, you can just kind of tell that that position of privilege and that position of complacency and comfort has basically made the the Israeli military uh, much worse overall, too. That arrogance and that hubris also led to October 7. Your epic almost five hour debate with uh, Moyen Rabani and uh, Benny Morris and. And something else. <laughs> yeah. Destiny. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, and it was striking at the very end of the debate, I said that Israel now faces a strategic uh, dilemma, a serious strategic dilemma. The dilemma is that a large number of people in the Arab world after October 7th suddenly came to the realization or the epiphany, hmm, Israel is not as strong as we thought it was, or Israel is not as invincible as we thought it was. Yeah. And yep. Benny Morris at that point, Professor Morris, very smart guy, he kind of had a nervous laugh and he said, ah, oh, that's ridiculous. We have atomic bombs. We have nuclear weapons. Right. What was striking to me about that answer was he didn't say we have the IDF, we have the army. He had lost faith in it. Hmm. So now he had to talk about Damn. the deterrence of their nuclear weapons. So I don't believe that October 7th was a passing error, mistake, a moment of incompetence. It was a reflection of the fact that Israel no longer is what it once was. Now, of course... Are they going to flex their muscles, though, to prove that they actually do have capacity? Well, that's what they're doing now. Goading, perhaps, Hezbollah. Uh, Obviously, we also have the Houthis in, in, in the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. with their uh, sea blockade, and we also have the Hamas issue. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a thought here that to show that they're yeah, still right. invincible. I, I think there's a very big problem there. Yeah. I think the problem is that Israel has one of its central military concepts. This is what it calls its deterrence capability. And deterrence capability is just a fancy term for the Arab world's fear of us. And they are very worried now that the Arab world... Arab leaders aren't angels, though. They share the same accountability with the USA and EU. Bro, I'm not talking about the rest of the Arab world, okay? ...because of what happened on October 7th, no longer fears them. And so one of the reasons for what's been happening is, in their language, to restore their deterrence capacity. And that does seem to... Include if they had any fucking balls, Hezbollah. so they do a I fraction of what the Yemen far, uh, population has done, from with the far end less of what began on October seventh, and it could take forms which will or at least apply real political pressure, maybe a global catastrophe. Professor Frankelstein, thanks so much for joining me on the front. You're Pleasure welcome. talking to you.